Peter Siato in Budapest, welcome to Hard Talk. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, Foreign Minister, the relationship between your country and the European Union, the institutions of the EU, appears ever more dysfunctional. How concerned are you about that? Well, what I would say is that uh, we definitely have uh, debates uh, with the institutions in uh, Brussels. Actually, we are under a continuous uh, attack. Whatever we decide, European institutions uh, find a way to put some uh, pressure on us and try to blackmail us in order to change our decisions and uh, do not take advantage uh, of the national uh, competences. I think the major issue is that the European uh, Union's uh, future uh, is um, under debate now. I mean, how we can make the European Union stronger in the future. And there are two major approaches in this regard, a federalistic type of approach, which is represented by the institutions themselves and which would like to build kind of a United States of Europe, which we definitely oppose. And there's another approach, which is now in minority, I have to admit, and this is represented by Hungary as well. And this approach says that we need strong European Union, but a strong European Union must be based on strong member states. And that's why we do not support any other competencies to be brought to Brussels from the member states. And this is the core of the issue. This is core of the debate uh, we do have. Uh, among ourselves, but, uh, but I would like well, to underline again that yeah. our goal is to make the European Union stronger and definitely Brussels thinks uh, differently in this regard. Yes, I mean that, that philosophical debate about the future of Europe is something that's been going on for decades and I dare say will go on for decades more, but there's a much more day-to-day -day problem here which you as Foreign Minister, as chief diplomat of your country, you have to wrestle with and that is that many EU leaders, that is heads of state, as well as the institutions themselves, see Hungary as acting in a way that is completely antipathetic to the values of the EU. And that is concerning specific policy decisions made in Hungary. Are you prepared to consider changing your approach? No, definitely. We are not going to change our approach. And I don't agree with uh, those uh, whom you have uh, quoted uh, here. We act according to the common European uh, values. We act according to the common European regulations. These are all perceptions. These are all politically motivated perceptions. We are a uh, conservative, Christian democratic, patriotic government with a very stable background in parliament and in society, which gives a very, very minor, very, very small room for uh, external interference in the country. I think this is the biggest problem of those who are attacking us. We are always happy to discuss concrete issues, issue by issue, regulation by regulation. We are ready for the debate. We are ready for the dialogue. But putting forward perceptions, I think, simply does not make any kind of sense. We'll go through it issue by issue. But before we get to the specific issues, would you acknowledge this is going to cost Hungary? It's become plainer in the last week that it's going to cost you potentially billions of euros because the EU is not releasing its special COVID, post-COVID recovery funds, 7 billion euros of which Hungary has applied for, it's not going to release those funds for you unless you comply with the so-called rule of law values of the EU. And in the latest report just come out from Brussels, the EU sees, quote, insufficient safeguards against political influence in your system, risks of clientelism, favoritism, nepotism in public administration, risks arising from the link between business and political actors. This is going to cost you money. Uh, Steve, let me um, uh, give you answers in uh, three um, uh, different points. I, I promise I'll be short. First, it is just being simply ridiculous what you have uh, quoted uh, from this report. And, and please do not take it personally because it's not you. It is a report uh, what I'm uh, uh, speaking about. This is a politically motivated, biased, unbalanced, unfair, uh, blackmailing type of uh, document. Second you, point you, you, I want to make well, is... Well, let's start that, with point uh, one. We, you can say that. You, you talk about attacks. Yeah, You've okay. now just issued your own very grave attack on the conclusions of an EU body. 
You can do that, but it's not going to change their conclusions. I come back to the point, you're supposed to be the chief diplomat. You're supposed to find ways through these problems. All you're doing with me is yeah. ratcheting up the rhetoric. Look, I am not going to be ready to give up the national interest. And I will never be shy to protect my country. And I never be shy to stand up against lies against my country. Because these, what you have quoted, and once again, Steve, it's not you, is the report is being based on lies. These are simply not true. These are politically motivated against, against uh, politically motivated attacks against my country. This has been the case, Steve, since we have taken office 11 years ago here in Hungary, a conservative, patriotic, Christian democratic government, which definitely goes against the international liberal mainstream, and that's the consequence. But then, I'm not going to be giving you, Foreign Foreign Minister, Foreign Minister, to you should, you, All I can say to you, Foreign Minister, is that you shouldn't have signed up to the club because the club has rules, and you have to accept those rules as long as you're in the club. And the latest rule, which you accepted last year, was that there would be conditionality on the release of these very important recovery funds. You signed up to that. You're going to have to accept it. No. Look... We are members of the European Union. We act according to the European values and we act according to the European regulations as well. Well, you don't, act, the to, you don't act according to the, the values, European, as we know it, from yeah, this we report. We do. We do. We do. But this report is simply a uh, bunch of lies, I have to tell you. We act according to the common values. We act according to the common regulations. And what the European Commission makes is the following, Steve, that they use the European funds for blackmailing. They use the European funds to interfere into domestic political issues which are being based purely on national competence. And this is absolutely unacceptable because, look, this is what I'm telling you. The Hungarian people and Hungary itself has been contributing to the European economic achievement. European funds are based on the European political achievement. We are contributing to that. And European funds are not matters of generosity of our friends in Brussels. These are not humanitarian donations. These are the money. This is the money of the European taxpayers, including the Hungarian people. But so blackmailing us yeah, with well, not releasing, with not releasing financial funds based on political issues is simply unacceptable. And even more than that, goes against the European values and European regulations. Well, you, you can call it blackmail, but ultimately the money sits in Brussels, not with you, and you won't get the money unless you change course. And there's another point to what you say. That is, you draw this distinction between national competencies and the business of the EU. But the truth is, again, because you've signed up to the club, you have to adhere to core European values as adjudicated by the European Court of Justice. And in one very important area right now, the Europeans believe you are again flagrantly violating their standards. And that comes with your new law which bans what you call the promotion of homosexuality and information about LGBT issues in your schools. The way it's seen in Europe is it's a flagrant violation of European values. Uh, Steve, you know, in the uh, European Union, uh, there's a very, very clear division of competencies. There are competencies uh, which... Uh, are the ones of Brussels, so-called community competencies, and there are competencies which are purely national. This is being written in the European regulations. It's crystal clear. It's black and white. If I can, can come back just to, for one sentence to the money, I can tell you that even without the releasing of these funds, we will be able to uh, significantly increase the achievement of the Hungarian um, uh, economy. We will have a very significant GDP growth at the end of the year, even without these funds. Now, regarding uh, the law, what you were kind enough um, to uh, mention, Steve. Here, the fact is the following, that the Hungarian parliament has modified some already existing laws. Now, this has two consequences. The first consequence is that crimes committed um, uh, in the relationship with pedophilia are being penalized, sanctioned in a very, very hard, very severe, very serious way. The second part, the second part of the law says that it is the exclusive right of the parents, of the parents 
to conduct the education of their children regarding sexual orientation as long as they are under the age of 18. This is what the law says. It says that it is being prohibited to uh, present uh, explicit uh, pornographic uh, content to these children, to, uh, rep to present the uh, uh, changing of gender for the kids, and to promote um, homosexuality for right. the kids. Hang on. Let, let, Once again, let's, I want to say that for the kids be, un let, under the age hmm. of 18. Let's try to be simple and clear here. Simple question. Is sex education happening in Hungarian schools and will it continue to happen? Look, the children study biology. And in biology, uh, you uh, do you no, have I'm asking uh, the you a simple question. Part, I'm asking uh, you a simple question. Does sex yeah. education happen in yeah, Hungary? And I'm schools? asking in a very and, and I'm, I'm, no, I'm not talking about in, biology. I'm I know you teach in a biology. Very simple way. I'm talking about sex education, yeah. which includes education about relationships, giving kids positive information about the diverse nature of sexual relationships. Does that happen in Hungary's schools? Look, the um, education regarding sexual orientation can definitely take place by professional uh, staff, by authorized staff. What we ban, what we ban is that activists of certain NGOs enter the schools and kindergartens and uh, talk to our children without the permission and the knowledge uh, of ours about sexual orientation. No, we, we, I can well, tell well, you, Steve, respect, that no NGO. Sorry, sorry. If I can, if I can just finish because this is this is always the always the uh, always the thing that you put forward fake news about my country, about the regulations here. You quote some biased reports, and then when we try to uh, explain, we never have the opportunity because. I really do believe that no NGO, no NGO knows my kids, my sons better than I do. And I definitely stick to my right to conduct their education regarding the sexual orientation and not an NGO in the school or in the kindergarten. Well, this as, is as you mentioned your, as you mention your honest, kids, as you mention honest, your I kids. I don't understand, I don't understand why, why, why there are attacks on that. As you mention your kids, Sorry. Foreign Minister, I think it's only fair for me to ask you that if one of your kids, I, I don't know if your kids have, have reached teenage yet, but as and when your kids reach teenage, who knows, one of them might be gay, who knows, we don't know. But would you, if you had a gay child in school, not want them to re receive an inclusive, positive, affirming set of information about homosexuality? What I know is the following. I have two sons, age of seven and age of 10. And I can talk to them about basically anything when I see that uh, they reach that kind of level of development when their circle of interest is reaching there. But that's not the question I asked you about. I asked about you about the issues. messages you but want them to me. receive but, but in school. On. It's gonna be me. It's, it's gonna be me, it's gonna be me who is going to talk to them about such kind of issues. So, I stick to it. No one, uh, no LGBT activist in the school, but me. So, I'll talk to them about these issues whenever I think it's necessary and whenever I think the situation is appropriate for that. So here, we have, here we have another way in which 18, the relationship... It's another issue. OK, you've been very pl plain with me, thank you. Here we have another issue in which we are clearly heading for a car crash between your government and the EU. The European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has described the law which we've just discussed as, quote, shameful. We know the EU Commission has already launched legal proceedings against you in your government because of this law, because they are quite clear that it violates European values and laws in several respects. This could end up in the European Court of Justice. Is that what you want? Look, I think uh, what's shameful is what the uh, president of the European Commission has done. You know, because last time it was in communism that the judgment took place before the trial. So the European Commission thinks, thinks that this law could go against some common European regulations. That's why they have launched a um, procedure uh, against us. During this procedure, we will give our arguments, we will discuss, we will debate. If we cannot convince each other, then the issue will go to the European Court. But, but announcing the judgment even before the trial 
would be started. This is how it was in communism in Hungary. So it's shameful what the president of the European Commission has done in this regard. Well, with, with respect, you've described various things the EU has done as more than shameful. So her expressing an opinion, I'm, I'm hardly understanding why you're so upset about that. You're very opinionated about all sorts of things. But the bottom line is your Prime Minister, Mr Orban, has now announced that there'll be a referendum. He says, and I'm quoting him, with the pressure, he means the pressure from Brussels, on Hungary so strong only the people's will can protect Hungary. That's classic populism, but it actually, again, doesn't follow the law, does it? Because whatever you might vote in a referendum, you still have to accept the authority of the European Court of Justice, unless you're no longer prepared to do that. Uh, <clears throat> you say uh, populism, I respect you, and I respect your opinion, but I think this is democracy. Because democracy is about the uh, fulfillment of the will of the people. And now the people will have a chance to uh, make their will very clear. But real they democracy is also about respecting the rule of law, and in this case, respecting the European Court of Justice. So frankly, your referendum doesn't mean anything. What really matters is the ruling of the European Court. No, come on. I mean, uh, considering the will of the people, which means nothing, this is very anti-democratic, uh, I think. I, uh, still, uh, I am still sure about the fact that the law which the Hungarian parliament has passed is absolutely in line with the European regulations because the European Charter of Fundamental Rights says that the parents do have the right to ensure that the education of their kids is in conformity uh, with their social, pedagogical and uh, psychological um, aspects. So what we have done here is absolutely within the European regulations. And even more than that, issues of education are falling within the uh, national competencies. So a uh, referendum will definitely count. We are ready to uh, give the chance to the people to announce their opinion very clearly and everybody will have to respect that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you saw, Foreign Minister, last year, Freedom House, the, the democracy watchdog group, they said that Hungary could no longer be considered as a, as a full free democracy. They describe you now as partly free and one of their biggest concerns was press freedom in your country and the fact that 80 percent of the media in Hungary is in one way or another closely linked or associated with the ruling party and the prime minister. It's not healthy is it? You know I do not really care about what Freedom House says about my country because it is being unserious to what they do. So saying that 80% of Hungarian media is somehow touched to uh, the government side is just simply a huge, huge, huge fake news. If uh, you spoke Hungarian as you do not, you would be aware that this is absolutely not true. If you uh, look at the internet, you look at what kind of news are being circulated on a daily basis, you will see a huge majority of articles being against the government and a minority of them which are kind of uh, pro what uh, we have been doing. You cannot name, Steve, one, uh, one uh, sector of Hungarian media where the market leaders would not be very heavily anti-government. So this, what Freedom House says, is a simple lie in this regard as well, unfortunately, I have to say. Let's talk about the specific revelations we've learned in recent days from a, a group of international investigative journalists, the so-called Pegasus revelations about the use of new spyware developed in Israel. It apparently has been used to hack into the phones and the even the encrypted messaging services of uh, individuals around the world. What is fascinating is that the leaks show that 300 at least Hungarian phone numbers, mostly connected to journalists, lawyers, some business uh, leaders, have been hacked and a former NSO employee speaking to the Washington Post says that the Hungarian government was a client. Why have you been doing this? I'm sorry, but who says that? A former employee of this company, NSO, that developed the spyware says your government was a client. Yeah, but who is he? I mean, uh, this is... Uh someone who uh, says something in a secret or a hidden way or has some any kind of evidences or did he show 
any kind of documentation about that or I don't know. I mean, you are building a huge international campaign on someone who uh, who makes a, um, a statement uh, with no evidences or what are we speaking about? Well, what are you speaking about? Are you denying it? Yes or no? Did the Hungarian government use this spyware? Look, uh, don't go into a Soviet type of propaganda and uh, don't uh, oh, Minister, don't, it's a uh, very, very your, simple uh, question. This has nothing to do yeah. with Soviet propaganda. Yeah. It's a no, very no. simple but question. No. Did yeah, you is. use it this is. spyware? It is. it is. It is because you, uh, you, uh, you paint a, uh, or portray the situation as if there were no secret services uh, in every state and these secret services would not um, use a different kind of technologies in order to protect national security. As far as I understood from this report, which I, I guess you refer to, said that there were 45 countries on the globe, 45 governments and like 60 or 65, I don't remember the, the exact number, secret services who have bought this uh, technology. My question is, is it a crime that a uh, secret service uh, buys a technology through which uh, the secret service can protect national uh, security interests? Is that the crime or why? why, why well, let why me you quote you question? the words of one direct 36 journalist, Sabolj Panyi, who uh, we know it has been his phone has been analyzed. He was hacked in this way. He was surveilled. The spyware was put on his phone. He says, I am being treated as a threat, like a Russian spy or a terrorist or a mobster. This is a Hungarian journalist who happens to be not a friend of your government who has been surveilled. And you won't even tell me whether your government is responsible. Look, what I can tell you is the following. You can be absolutely sure that since we have taken office here in Hungary, which was uh, 2010, we have not monitored, we have not wiretaped anybody uh, in an illegal way. You can be absolutely sure about it. No one was wiretapped just because of being journalist or no one was wiretapped just because of um, not being friendly to the government. You can be absolutely sure about that, Steve. We, we must end, Foreign Minister. I'm going to leave you with these comments from the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte at the last EU summit. He said, quote, for me, Hungary has no place in the EU anymore. If you don't like it, he said, sort of directing his comments at Hungary, there is an alternative, leave the union. Would you share that sentiment? Yeah, and might you this, consider uh... it? No, this Dutch prime minister hates the Hungarians. He's kind of hungarophobic. I can tell him and tell you that Hungary has been in the European Union and will be in the European Union and will be working for a strong European Union in the future as well. Foreign Minister Peter Siato in Budapest, I thank you very much indeed for being on Hard Talk. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.